John Gacy was a model citizen, a friendly entrepreneur, member of the Chamber of Commerce, politically active. Active in the local Democratic Party, he proudly posed with First Lady Rosalind Carter. He made extra money dressing up as a clown for children's birthday parties. But there was an edge to his wisecracking alter ego. Unlike most classic clowns, the lines of his mouth and eyes weren't rounded, but harsh, spiked, giving him a death's head image. This smile was not comforting, and there was something in Gacy's eyes that shouldn't be seen in a clown or in anyone else. Gacy was one of the most sadistic and astoundingly prolific mass murderers of the late 20th century. The basement of his nondescript suburban home was a literal graveyard of reeking, putrefying corpses, yet none of his friends or co-workers suspected he was anything but a model citizen. John Gacy was born in Chicago in 1942. As a boy, he suffered emotional and physical abuse at the hands of his alcoholic father and underprotective mother. His father, a frustrated Polish immigrant, took his drunken fury out on his boy, who retreated into an inner world of hypochondria, always complaining of an imaginary illness. This is the voice of John Wayne Gacy from prison. I know with my dad, I never got along with him while he was alive. I never could please him. And, of course, with him drinking in his Jekyll and Hyde routine when he drank, he was a son of a bitch, you know. And I, I just kind of stayed away from it as much as possible. But he always said you'd never amount to anything, and you're dumb and stupid and all that, you know. So I went out and made my own way. But he died at the uh, age of 69. Of course, I had older parents, too. My dad was almost 40 when he got married. He was 38, my mother was 30 when they got married. So you can, you can tell there's a, there's a great gap in age difference. Uh, my dad was 40 years older than I was. So it's hard to sometimes relate to that, especially he come from the old country, you know, from Poland. And you just didn't... masked his unnatural urges. At night, his wife gone, he would drive the gay districts of Chicago, taking hustlers or innocents back to his home. 
plying his young victims with beer, the gregarious host would play pool, joke around, and show his trick handcuffs. Gacy would lock himself up and escape with a flick of the wrist. The guests would try, and suddenly they were caught. Gacy would assault his constrained victims sexually, sometimes for hours, then strangle them. During another stretch in prison, Gacy carried the victim's body to a crawl space beneath his home and buried him. For more than three years, the Gacy cellar filled with victims, often one buried atop the other. By day, he remained a staunch, public-spirited citizen working with the Chicago Democratic Party. Never content with the truth, Gacy exaggerated his volunteer standing and even had business cards printed that proclaimed him a precinct captain. Drugs and drink exacerbated his mental unbalance. His nighttime activities diminished his desire for sex with his wife, and he beat her often. She divorced him in 1978. Without even the vestige of normal home life, Gacy broadened the scope of his predatory sexual murders. His first few dozen victims had been streetwise punks. Now, with no snooping wife, he expanded his taste to young boys who worked for him or were simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. In a two-month span, Gacy sodomized and murdered at least five young boys in his suburban house of horrors. Visitors invariably noted the awful stench rising from the floor. Jolly John Gacy always shrugged it off as something stuck in the plump. Fifteen-year-old Robert Peast disappeared on December 11th, 1978, having told his mother he was seeing a contractor about a job. He didn't come home that night. The next day, police found out that a contractor had recently remodeled the drugstore where Robert worked, a contractor named Gacy. Police confronted Gacy, who denied knowing the boy. They noticed the stench from beneath the house, but could do nothing. Learning about his sodomy conviction, they placed him under surveillance. Undercover police tracked Gacy to the Des Plaines River, where he lost his police tail. On the drive back, he swerved off the road and was arrested. Gacy seemed dazed and glassy-eyed, giving a rambling, lie-filled statement about his activities and the missing young boy. Investigating further, they followed their noses to the crawl space beneath his home. As they continued to dig, the horror became mind-numbing. It was beyond disgusting or revolting. There were no words for it, only numbers. Beneath the house, detectives and forensics experts found the rotting remains of 29 bodies. Running out of room in his personal graveyard, Gacy had planted three more in his garden. Another four bodies were dredged up from the Des Plaines River. Gacy's house was torn to the ground, his garage torn apart, his driveways excavated for more victims. The total seemed to be 36 over six years. At least that's what he admitted. His defense attorney claimed innocence by virtue of insanity, but the jury did not agree. Gacy was sentenced to the electric chair. On death row, Gacy was prolific a writer as he had been a killer. Among his hundreds of pen pals were heavy metal musicians, psychologists, artists, and Christian ministers, always slyly adjusting the tone of his letters to fit the recipient. Despite his obvious guilt, he sent out monthly newsletters and wrote a self-serving book presenting obfuscations and outright lies that he felt supported his blamelessness. Gacy received grim fame as an artist selling paintings and sketches from prison, much to the disgust of the parents of his dozens of victims. After years on death row, John Wayne Gacy was executed by lethal injection. In 1998, years after Gacy's execution, the parking lot near his mother's house was tested with sonar. Other bodies were discovered. His mother never believed her son John was a killer. Mothers are like that.